but uh, let me welcome Lakshmi Mandiam. Uh, she's the Director of Server Systems and Ecosystems at ARM, where she leads ARM's initiatives on servers. Lakshmi has been with ARM for four years, where she's led ARM's market initiatives for enterprise networking, wireless infrastructure, set-top boxes, and storage. Prior to ARM, she worked in a variety of engineering, marketing, and management roles at various companies, including Freescale Semiconductor and Cold Watt. She has a BSE from the University of Texas at Austin, and um, at ARM, she's delighted to be able to change people's perceptions about being able to deliver high-performance enterprise solutions in an energy-efficient mobile power profile. So, welcome to Lakshmi. Thanks, Anne. I didn't realize it would be a whole bunch of software people. Um, you know, the folks in hardware always say, if you didn't have hardware, you wouldn't have anything to run your software on. <laughs> um, and, and also, it, it reminded me, your comment reminded me of um, the power engineering. You know, I'm a WC, WCE, computer engineer, and all the power systems guys would always say, well, if you didn't have us, you wouldn't have anything to run. So it's, it's kind of interesting to hear that, that, uh, that why were we going on. So my title of my presentation is slightly different uh, from the, the accurate title that Anne had advertised, so um, you'll forgive my, uh, let's say, marketing um, uh, creative license here in terms of the title, but it is relevant. Actually, I don't have the clicker. So, no, I meant the forwarding thing. Yeah, this one. Okay, thank you. Um, so it's actually quite relevant uh, in terms of where we see the industry shifting to um, for uh, next generation servers and data centers. So we'll touch on a couple of different topics. So I'll give you a little bit of an introduction to ARM. I think most people in the room know who ARM is. If you don't know us, you're probably a user um, with your mobile phones. You can't live without them. Um, so you're already an ARM user, but um, so I'll talk a little bit about ARM and what we do, uh, give you an introduction to where we see the server market heading towards and some of the ARM products that are targeted towards the enterprise market. And when I say enterprise, of course, I'm talking primarily about servers today, but there's also been a lot of pickup in adjacent markets like networking and wireless infrastructure, which I was working on before. And then I'll give you a few examples of some of the partner systems that are being deployed uh, in the market today uh, based on the ARM architecture. Okay, so if we think about where the planet is, is heading and, and what's happening, um, we see that, there, that over the next 20, actually over the next 10 years, there's going to be a third of the world's population increasing over where we are today. And we expect that there's going to be around 3 billion uh, middle class uh, folks. And, and if you think about the environmental impact on that, it's actually quite astounding. Um, the expectation is that by 2030, we're going to increase the energy consumption by 60%. Now here in the US, we're actually quite lucky because the cost of energy for us is very low compared to the rest of the world. But you can imagine with this rate of growth and with the, with the growth of devices like this and the smartphones and the traffic that it's, it's generating, it's unsustainable uh, to carry on the way we are in terms of, of using our natural resources. So if we, if we, the other scarce natural resource is, of course, water, um, where we expect over the next 13 years, 18 countries will actually run out of water. So if you think about these things, we can't keep going the way we have been going in terms of uh, developing infrastructure and the products that, we, that we're developing. There has to be um, a way that we can, we can um, do better. So technology uh, can actually bring efficiencies um, to benefit all. So if we think about the consumer, uh, for example, um, people are now moving into this post-PC era. So if you think about, actually, this is my Windows RT device based on the ARM Tegra 3. Yes, this is a, this is a walking commercial. But 
Um, I have actually given up using my laptop and I'm using this permanently. And one of the benefits is um, it actually consumes about the sixth of the power that is consumed by a traditional laptop. So you can imagine the overall savings that are occurring in, in, in the world um, by switching to these kinds of energy efficient devices. Um, the other area, of course, is thinking about things like HDD going to flash. All of these kinds of technologies that all of us in this room are working on can bring significant energy savings to the industry. Um, and in terms of infrastructure, over the last year, we've seen some of ARM partners announce products that will actually reduce consumption of power on the base station arena um, by up to 70%. And yesterday, there was an announcement from HP where they talked about their new servers um, uh, actually reducing power consumption by about 89%. So you can see technology has a lot of benefits in it and, and is advantageous um, to, to society in general. And we look at the transportation industry, that's another interesting area. So if you think about your kids' games consoles that are plugged in all the time, um, there's been some estimates that said if your kids just switched off the game console at the end of their play session, you would actually save about 11 billion kilowatts a year. So ARM technologies are looking at how can we do things like smart lighting. For example, an annual uh, in your home, um, I think 30 to 40 percent of, of uh, energy consumption in the home uh, is in the homes. And so you can think about having intelligent lighting systems, intelligent control systems, and IoT kind of things that everyone is talking about to bring greater and greater energy efficiency. So these are examples of some of the ways that technology can, can, uh, can provide uh, uh, benefits and savings. So thinking about ARM technologies, we actually have processors that scale from a microcontroller called an M0, uh, which is in several lighting systems. It's in touch screen controllers. Um, it's actually going into several uh, crazy applications like heart rate monitors and things like that, um, which, which consumes in the microamps per megahertz kind of range of, a range of power consumption, all the way to products that are going into base stations and servers and routers with our Cortex-A uh, profile of products. And of course, we have a rich um, arena of consumer applications that ARM products are going into. So um, this is the Samsung Chromebook, which uses our Cortex-A15 uh, processor and our, and our graphics technology. And there also, you can see several devices like the Windows RT device that I was talking about earlier. So let's think a little bit about how um, the world is changing in terms of consumer behavior. Um, so if we think about, sorry, I just want to check something. Uh, if we think about how shopping profiles have changed um, in the last, uh, even from last year to this year. So this is kind of a view on how people shopped during the holidays. Um, so previously, we all used to go line up outside Best Buy at 4 o'clock in the morning to buy our TVs and you know, it was quite a painful process. But actually what's happened, mobile has made that um, experience a lot easier. So things like scanning the best price uh, before you go shopping, trying to find the best price online, um, and finding local stores that offer the best deals. Um, so you can see there's been a lot of um, analysis. I think there was a survey by uh, IBM that showed um, so, for example, price grabber saw a 3,343% increase uh, in smartphone usage, and PayPal saw that their smartphone transactions increased significantly year on year. So you can see this whole trend towards a mobile lifestyle is driving the way people are doing business um, and, uh, and living. And it's also reshaping um, our behavior. I, I talked about the fact that I've left my laptop behind and I'm now using this um, tablet device. Um, it saves my back. I travel a lot. I was in China last week or week before and I forgot to charge my tablet one day. It didn't kill me. I could still use it for, for a couple of days. So there's a lot of benefits in terms of people's expectations on user behavior. 
Um, so I think Amazon, for example, now most of the books are e-books. They don't even, um, the majority of, of users buy um, uh, e-books. And 48% of kids, I'm sure you were all familiar with this at Christmas, why didn't I get an iPad? Why didn't I get a mini iPad? So you can see it's really um, taken uh, the world by storm. And actually in Q4, I think globally, tablets outsold um, PCs. And it's, the expectation is that this year, I believe that tablets will outsell um, laptops. So what does that mean? And why is that relevant to this conversation? It's relevant because most of these systems today are very high-performant, multi-core systems. Um, so this is an example of all the processor technologies or processors that exist um, in the smartphone today. So for example, the modem, the cellular modem, has multiple ARM cores. These are our Cortex-R, which are our real-time cores and are, um, and are actually quite high performance cores. Uh, and then we have the Bluetooth systems that also have multi-cores. Uh, we have the applications processors. So I think this year we had partners that were shipping quad-core phones and actually announced octal-core designs. Um, so you can see, and actually uh, some of the smartphone ships have gone into supercomputers. So the Barcelona supercomputing project actually used uh, a Tegra device that had ARM Cortex A9 devices in it. And then this year there was also an announcement on Mont Blanc using the Samsung Exynos chipset. So you can see the way people are looking um, at the compute paradigm is completely different. Um, they're actually viewing um, smartphone and tablet and those devices uh, as, the, as the engine that's driving innovation and driving the compute industry. So a little bit of background. So we're in all of those devices that I talked about. Um, and uh, our processors are, as I said, in microcontrollers. And I think we shipped around 8.7 billion units last year based on the ARM architecture. So we're the largest architecture by volume. So with that, I want to talk a little bit about uh, the server market and some of the trends. So there is, um, if you think about some of these large cloud services and internet giants like Baidu, Facebook, um, Amazon, and all of and the cloud hosting folks like Amazon and et cetera, the server is the critical element of their business. It is the revenue generating asset of their business. Um, and they're looking um, to figure out how can they maximize their profit. So every single dollar cent um, that they eke out in terms of efficiencies from any way, whether you think about it in terms of cost of deployment, cost of ownership, cost of acquisition, all of those things um, really goes to their bottom line. So there is a lot of interest in terms of trying to optimize this revenue generating asset um, for their business. It's also Interesting because these guys, again, since they're focused on such optimizations, they're also focused on optimizing uh, software assets that are running on those devices. And so a lot of these guys are going open source. I'm sure many of you are working on, on those kinds of projects. Um, open source and they own their own software stack. So some of the legacy barriers that have existed in terms of enterprise IT infrastructure no longer exist because these guys have the volume, have the scale, have the engineering might uh, to be able to develop and deploy their own software uh, infrastructure around it. And these guys are, are also um, willing to go off and innovate and investigate a new technology, again, because they own the entire uh, software stack and supply chain um, for that business. So a great example of that is Facebook with their open compute uh, project where they are saying we're going to define all these standards, we're going to drive the industry, we're going to drive the ecosystem to develop what we need uh, to be deployed. So speaking of Facebook, this is actually from uh, Facebook's Open Compute uh, Forum. So you can see the kind of challenges uh, that, they're, that they're experiencing. So for example, there are more than 240 billion photos that are uploaded onto Facebook. And users add 
350 million pictures a day. And especially if it's Halloween, I think Halloween was their biggest volume in terms of pictures that were uploaded. But the beauty of the Facebook generation is that they have short attention spans. So you upload a picture, six hours later, that's old news. I don't want to see it. So people are, are, you know, they have to basically think about how do they have a cold storage for that kind of photograph, which is no longer relevant or valid even later in the day. Um, and so f the storage, but they also have to store these photographs for a long period of time. So the photo storage alone is growing by seven petabytes a month. And that is an incredible growth curve in terms of trying to build out infrastructure to match that kind of demand. And this is where they're, they're looking to reduce the cost of ownership and, and the cost of, of adding that kind of scale. So, oh, I'm going to show you a, can I pause this? The most important driver of the cost this is of a Jane modern Campbell data center from Amazon. is power. And so anything we can do to lower the power for a given amount of work done is extraordinarily valuable. And nowhere is there a richer R&D stream on power performance and power optimization than in the cell phone world. What's happening in the cell phone world as a predictor of what's coming in the server world, technologies that show up first in the cell phone world end up in the server world. There is tremendous growth um, in the demand for compute, the amount of data being stored. Um, as everybody's phone became a client, right? I mean, that, that's the new client device is their phone, and, and, and ARM has, has really won the battle in the new client side. But what that means is uh, these clients want to do work, and that work is done in the data center. On the back end, the challenge is just around the sheer volume of data. Um, we think we're managing big data today, um, but, but we haven't seen anything yet. And so the, the ability to actually harness that power, um, leverage what really ARM brings to bear in terms of you know, new age computing and the future where we want to take server architectures to get better yield and better performance um, out of a, the same footprint, uh, the same data center footprint um, with lower power constraints and you know, better usability. We see a, 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 an upswell from our customers for choice and that they are not wedded to an instruction set. They're, they're wedded to uh, a trajectory that provides them uh, lower cost computing over time, to, that provides them more efficient computing over time, and they are uh, eager to see um, what can be done with uh, w with ARM cores uh, after years and years of, of seeing what was done with, with, with x86 cores. Okay, so sorry that video started before I wanted it to, but um, so the three speakers in that were James Hamilton from Amazon, um, Andrew Feldman from CMicro, which was now uh, acquired by AMD and he's part of their server group, and Judson Altoff, who at the time was um, at Oracle, but I think has, since, has moved on since there. But why I wanted to share that video with you is you can see that there's a lot of momentum and interest in the industry behind, I guess evidenced by the full room here, uh, behind ARM uh, in the server, work, server realm. So it's always good to hear from other people as opposed to me talking about um, drinking our own Kool-Aid to a certain extent. So. I don't know, this is going to move on. There we go. So how do we think servers will evolve and, and how do we see um, from an SOC or hardware perspective, how do we see that evolving over time? So today, um, if you think about servers as just being kind of a static single uh, one node or two node server, you have multiple um, apps uh, and, and OS is running uh, on the CPU, if you, if you think, think about how that's going. And now with, with the cloud, um, people are trying to get more utilization out of their existing server infrastructure, and so they're deploying virtualization so that they can run uh, multiple work, workloads on a uh, large CPU core. We will then start to see a more distributed approach where people will want to run multiple instances of Linux or smaller 
workload applications and more to move towards physicalization where they'll want to run applications on a given specific node. And then, of course, over time, we see that the move to integration uh, will encompass heterogeneous processing. So a good example, I talked about it earlier, was the HPC world where um, having a, a GPU and a CPU integrated on a single SOC platform will bring uh, a lot of performance benefits. And another um, good example would be uh, in networking and storage. And I'll talk a little bit about what our partners are doing in that sphere. But ARM and partners have been involved with and driving integration in the SOC world for many, many years. Um, and specifically, the mobile is a great example where we've seen a, a significant cost trajectory come down in terms of integration. But there are other areas like mobile base stations, or, for example, where um, historically you had slots where you, know, you had separate risk processors, separate DSP farms, separate ASICs. And now we're seeing this trend towards integration of uh, base station on a chip router on the chip, anything on the chip you can think of they want to go in that direction. And clearly to be able, I know you guys are all software guys, but from a hardware perspective, to be able to integrate more and more um, functional elements on a single silicon uh, platform, you need to have a low power envelope to be able to do that. So low power CPUs allow you to integrate uh, more uh, on, on the SOC. So, one of the key things that I think has changed is people are realizing that one size does not fit all. So different workloads have different characteristics. So for example, um, obviously the green indicates high uh, compute intensive applications or historical things like database, um, online transaction processing, high performance computing. These are all things that are very compute intensive and traditional enterprise applications, obviously very compute intensive. What is storage? Um, storage is, what do you mean? All of the above. IO, IO, you know, IO transactions going to storage. Um, so essentially, there are applications like um, offline analytics, for example, where you really just need moderate compute, but it's really about how much IO transactions can I get going, how many IOPS can I get. And then there are applications like static web um, serving or content delivery networks, again, where it's less compute intensive uh, and more about the surrounding um, uh, integration and being able to get data in and out of the processor. So it's, it's less about... CPU intensity, more about how do I get overall better system performance. So some interesting, um, by the way, you don't have to take pictures. This is going to be uploaded, so you, you can get access to it. But anyway, some, of the, some interesting comments um, really uh, last year. So Wired Magazine, there was, a, there was an article um, where Frank Frankowski from Facebook talked about um, how they are actually in looking at their compute architecture and their platforms in a whole new paradigm. They're looking more about performance per watt per dollar. And they're, they're really architecture agnostic. So, you know, they're looking for how can a given CPU or a given architecture deliver the best performance. I don't really care what's underneath as long as it delivers the best performance that I'm looking for. Another interesting one was um, there was an, this, uh, this was from uh, a research note from Oppenheimer where they talked about um, if you want to transport a six-pack of beer, do you really need an 18-wheeler or can you just get away with a bicycle and holding it and going from one neighborhood to the next? So it's really a question of right-sizing the delivery method or the processing method for a given application and not trying to force-fit every single workload into a monolithic um, a platform that, that hasn't really seen a lot of innovation in the last 20 years. So how do we see things happening? So if you think about um, how the world is existing today, so this is kind of where we see the world as it is today. Um, so again, you know, historical um, enterprise vendors, uh, 
um, have been, you know, just servicing traditional IT. Um, and of course, from a hardware perspective, traditional guys have been, have been um, servicing, again, kind of monolithic application space. But we see a disruption coming where in the future, because of data, data center um, uh, scaling and, and all of the reasons I talked about earlier where people have a, a more control of their destiny, you're starting to see open source software become more commonly deployed. Um, so OpenStack, for example, already running on ARM um, and, and things like um, Hadoop-based workloads. Um, people are now deploying Ubuntu uh, for cloud-based applications. And you're starting to see, from a hardware perspective, new entrants like you know the ODM um, market out of Taiwan, where they see this as an opportunity to innovate and bring more value to their end customers. Uh, and also, uh, you see new software players coming into play. So it's not to say that a lot of these guys from this space, like Red Hat, for example, is talking about doing stuff in, in the cloud space as well. But you're just starting to see this disruption occurring where um, historical um, business models or historical ways of solving problems are not just going to work anymore. So one of the key things that I think it's important to know is that for ARM 32-bit servers today, there is a lot of the open source frameworks that exist today. I think 80% of the web uh, workloads can run on ARM today. So actually, um, since 2009, we actually had um, our own arm.com website, I think it's arm.linux.com, running on running the LAMP stack uh, on one of our partners, Marvell's um, hardware. And so we've had uh, this LAMP stack running on the ARM architecture for quite some time. We've also had, um, we had Oracle that announced support for 32-bit uh, uh, Enterprise Edition Java uh, and the C2JIT back in 2000 and, 11, I think it was, and so we've had actually Java uh, for enterprise applications running on the ARM architecture. Of course, we've had a long-term relationship with them from uh, the mobile side of things, but you know we've we've seen that happening. And so now with these these new common frameworks that run on Java um, uh, and things like Ruby on Rails, Python, Perl, all of these applications now run on the ARM architecture. And Canonical's uh, Juju provisioning tool also runs. Actually, Univa um, announced that their uh, platform management tool also now runs on the ARM architecture. And of course, OpenStack, the new uh, industry darling, uh, of course, also runs on the ARM architecture. And it's been demonstrated, I think, um, last year it was actually demonstrated. So you're starting to see that some of um, the, the historical barriers that might have existed for um, other architectures no longer um, exist, no longer are there for ARM. I'm not saying that we're going to have, you know, traditional enterprise software running on ARM right away, but the point is that with, with this new e uh, ecosystem disruption that's happening, you could expect that the other guys will want to get in on the action as well. So. said 80% of web workloads run on the ARM 32-bit architecture. There, of course, we still have some that are, that are not, but we do have at least 80% running today. We can take questions afterwards. Yeah. yeah. Um, so one of the things that ARM has invested in continuously uh, is Linux. And so about... Um, I guess it was four years ago we started an organization called Linaro uh, that's focused on um, standardizing Linux across uh, the ARM ecosystem. And it was focused on ensuring that we had a quality Linux kernel um, that could be uh, upstreamed. And so any distribution, we don't, so Linaro doesn't do distributions, it focuses on kernel quality and validation and tool chains and upstreaming that. Um, in, into uh, the open source. And so as a part of Linaro, we actually last fall um, created a group called the Linaro Enterprise Group, and it was focused on um, enabling 
Linux or working on foundational pieces of Linux that are required for the server architecture. And it's interesting, there were 14 companies that joined it. Um, and we had, of course, we had silicon, our silicon partners there, but we also had Facebook, HP, Red Hat, and Canonical. And this is, this is kind of a great model of collaboration because all these companies are pooling their resources uh, and working to accelerate time to market um, and, and be able to, so Facebook sees value in it to accelerate some of their um, specific uh, frameworks and, and underlying pieces that they need for their applications. So this is, you know, these, this is an example of the, of the kind of thing that's happening in the ARM ecosystem. So I'll talk a little bit about uh, ARM products for enterprise. So this is um, our roadmap. Our, our, um, so these are the 32-bit products that are shipping in, in the market today. Um, a lot of you are probably already Cortex-A9 users, and certainly this year will be Cortex-A15 users in terms of what's happening on the mobile space. But these products are also getting uh, shipped in infrastructure, um, infotainment, a whole, a whole bunch of different areas. And we have partners that are shipping server products today based on Cortex-A9 and Cortex-A15, uh, which are our uh, latest and greatest 32-bit uh, devices. We then, uh, last year, announced uh, Cortex-A57, which is our flagship 64-bit product, and Cortex-A53, uh, which is the little brother to that um, high-performance high product. And it's not just ARM that's developing uh, ARM-based cores. We have architectural uh, partners like Marvell. I think the publicly announced ones are Marvell, uh, Qualcomm. And then uh, in terms of, of the other partners, on, we've had Applied Micro that's talked about the fact that they're doing a server product uh, uh, based on the ARM architecture, Cavium. Uh, NVIDIA, these are some of the folks that have talked about doing um, their own implementations of the ARM architecture for the server market. So you can see ARM and partners actually scales uh, quite a bit in terms of the performance that we cover. No, they're a partner of ours. They're, they're developing parts based on Cortex A15. So I'll talk a little bit about Cortex-A9 because that's the product that's probably most widely uh, deployed today. And, and this device is a dual issue out of order uh, pipeline and it's about 2.5 DMIPS per megahertz. So at a gigahertz you get 2,500 DMIPS, but it's actually a very low power product. I think the power profile on that, Calzada has talked about implementing an entire SOC and being able to hit um, to the wall uh, 8 watts, but actually from just the SOC perspective about uh, 5 watts. So it's a pretty, pretty uh, low power product, but yet very uh, high performance. And so the architecture typically for the ARM products is we have a quad core. Our approach to, to um, many core is to scale in terms of quad core clusters. Um, and uh, so we'll have in this device, um, the Cortex-A9 class of products, on the SOC level, they'll have integrated L2s, but at the CPU level, the L2 um, is, is outside the, the quad-core cluster. Cortex-A15, we actually made several enhancements over our Cortex-A9 uh, based device, so we added extended physical addressing. Uh, getting up to 40-bit physical addressing, and we added hardware support for virtualization. Um, and so as a result, um, you, you can uh, get addressing up to one terabyte of physical memory. And we also added ECC. I think there's a, been a lot of misconception in the press about whether we support ECC or not and how that's relevant for enterprise products, more with A15. We do support ECC um, in both the L1 and L2 caches, and, and actually in, on A9 we support uh, ECC on the L2s and, and parity on the L1s. So um, there's, a, there's you know, support for enterprise level features. And this device is actually shipping in, um, as I said, uh, Chromebooks, and it's also shipping, I think yesterday if you were watching the news, HP announced their Moonshot pro program 
and A15 was a product. And I have a little bit more about that later in, in the presentation. So what have we done in terms of our transition? So what the next big step for us is to go to 64-bit. And one of the biggest questions we always get asked is, oh, what's the software transition going to be from 32-bit from to 64-bit? Well, the, the beauty of being a late entrant into the 64-bit arena is you get to see how things were done previously and think about improvements that could be made in terms of that transition process. Um, and so what we've done is we've actually, if you look at our 64-bit cores, they include our 32-bit instruction set and uh, the 64-bit instruction ex um, extensions. And so from a software migration perspective, your 32-bit code runs unaltered on our 64-bit cores. And if you want to take advantage of the 64-bit features, then you can uh, compile for 64-bit. So some of the instructions that we've, we've added, we've added crypto extensions. So um, uh, instructions to accelerate SHA and AES. So it's not really intended to be a bulk data encryption uh, engine, but really more for small block sizes for signatures and things like that. And we've also enhanced the SIMD capability on uh, these processors as well. So it's really, as I said, it's, it's really about being able to migrate applications and, and software that exists on 32-bit today over to 64-bit. And so some of the things that we've done is we've added uh, instructions to have better uh, uh, features for modern programming languages like C11, C++, and Java 5. Um, we've also added security, as I talked about. And the 64-bit the architecture is just a, a clean instruction set, um, and it's reduced complexity um, in terms of, of the programming model. So this is our 64-bit um, flagship product, the Cortex-A57. Again, it has our 64-bit ISA. It includes um, uh, the enhanced uh, cryptography support. We've extended and improved on the IEEE um, uh, single precision and double precision floating point. We've also improved the soft error recovery features again with ECC and parity and other things. Some of the things that we've done from our previous cores, we've actually increased the iCache and dcache, the iCache size to 48K. We did a lot of studies that showed um, there's benefit in, improve, in increasing the iCache size for the L1, not so much for, for, the, for the D cache size. We've also, um, the A15 already had an integrated L2. This one does as well. Um, and we've, we've got a next generation interconnect. We actually announced at, um, I think it was the Lindley conference last October, we announced our, our Core Connect uh, 504 uh, product and um, and that product is actually an, an on-chip network, and, it, and it's, it's, got, it's a high-performance uh, interconnect that can, get, that can get up to one terabyte in terms of on-chip um, um, data throughput. We've also, um, one of the things that I think maybe you've heard about it, we've, we've had a technology called Big Little, where we have our big core, which is our Cortex-A57, and the little core, which is a Cortex A53, and those are architecturally identical, but you can punt tasks back and forth uh, between them um, in, a front, in a seamless fashion. And so, for example, in a mobile application, when you're talking, you don't need the heavy lifting of a big processor, but when you're watching a cat, the cat playing with the wool on YouTube, then you need the heavy lifting of an, of an A15 or, or the large processor. And so we've done a lot of investment both in Linux and in the hardware on the CPU itself to be able to migrate those kinds of tasks seamlessly. And so this device, actually, we're in the, the Cadence um, audi uh, auditorium today. So a big shout out to our partners, Cadence, because we actually um, work together with uh, TSMC to do a tape out on 16 nanometer FinFET of the Cortex-A57 device. And I think that announcement came out last week. Um, and so you can see this is another example of where we just don't think about it from a CPU perspective. We go all the way from process, which I know you software guys don't care that much about. But, but we work kind of uh, up and down uh, that entire value chain. So this device is expected to get, uh, we have partners that are looking at 16 nanometer FinFET de designs. 
and we expect those to get to about two and a half gigahertz uh, in terms of, of production performance. So the little brother to that is the A53. So this is a, since I was coming to the IEEE, I figured I have to have at least one pipeline diagram. Um, and so you can see this is the, the Cortex A53 pipeline. It's a very simple pipeline um, and, uh, you know, focuses on throughput execution. And the Cortex A57 is A57 is a triple issue kind of a, a, a quad execution uh, pipeline, very complex, out of scalar execution, focused on single threaded performance. And, and A53 is focused on throughput. And so how we see these being deployed um, in, in the industry is we see folks that are needing really high um, per thread performance looking at doing um, 8 core, 16 core, even 32 core Cortex A57 based designs. And some of the applications are servers, high performance computing, enterprise routers, base stations, a whole bunch of enterprise class applications. And then for um, the smaller cores, and a good example, not that Tyler is using this core, but an example of where you would have a many core deployment um, and you really have very small uh, performance requirements or modest performance requirements and you could use the Cortex A53, many Cortex A53s, because of the small die size, the power consumption, um, you can actually pack many, many of these devices in a sea of cores kind of application. So here are some example partner systems. I think someone was asking, what about TI? Well, they're actually working on a, they actually announced a Cortex A15 based solution called the Keystone platform. I think they announced it to supercomputing last year. Marvell um, has been a long-term <coughs> partner of ours as well, and they're doing their Armada um, SOCs. And Calzada is our other partner who are work, who have are shipping their Cortex A9 based solutions and they've announced that they're doing a Cortex A15 based solution. In terms of folks that have announced um, their intent to do uh, Cortex A57, our own cores or their own deployments, uh, AMD, Applied Micro, Calzada, Cavium, NVIDIA, all of these guys are looking at doing um, ARM based designs for server applications. So let's talk a little bit about some uh, of these, uh, the products. So this is an example. So Marvell um, is known in two arenas. They're known as the lead guy in storage and they also have a very large um, Ethernet switching business. And so this is a great example of where ARM is bringing um, the core technology or the ISA and the ecosystem around that. And a partner like Marvell uh, is integrating um, their um, storage capability. So they have, you can see they've got um, SATA controllers and they've also got a PCI Express. Um, so they're trying to bring that in and they've also got uh, a switch chip integrated onto this device. And so a commercial deployment of that was earlier this year, Baidu actually announced um, that they are shipping a storage server based on Marvell's Armada SOC. And, and again, this is where the metric was really total cost of ownership. And by their estimation, by Baidu's estimation, they were able to achieve 25% better TCO using uh, Marvell's uh, ARM-based SOC platform, and, um, and they were able to get better performance density from a storage perspective. Another, uh, this is yesterday, I was actually in New York, um, HP announced their Moonshot program. Um, and one, some of the key, these are, this is my friend Carl Freund from Kyle Zeta holding up his uh, four node um, server board that was part of the HP Moonshot program. And this is Mike Major from Applied Micro who's holding his um, Applied um, V8 64-bit board uh, server that was announced as part of the HP platform as well. And so it was really interesting when HP was, was doing the launch, they were talking about how they felt they were now free um, to innovate. You know, historically they had to kind of stick to the 18-month cadence of innovation. And now with this larger partner ecosystem that they have based on the ARM architecture, they actually have a lot more processor options and choices uh, in terms of being able to um, innovate. And they actually talked about shipping 32-bit and 64-bit ARM products this year. 
And they also talked about a 3x faster time to market, and they believe that's because of a broader ecosystem um, of partners that's opened up. And one of the key things they also talked about, I think I referred to it earlier, is one size uh, does not fit all. And they had a couple of different partners um, they're talking about how they're really excited about using these heterogeneous processing elements like GPU, um, uh, DSP, or um, FPGA to be able to tailor their workloads um, to the server and therefore get uh, a lot more efficiency. And so it's really not just about energy efficiency, it's also about leveraging the innovation that's been happening in the smartphone and tablet markets. And so yesterday, while they announced Calzada, Applied, and TI were the ARM partners that were announced as part um, of, the, of the HP Moonshot platform, because they actually will have server cartridges shipping, they also announced their Pathfinder um, innovation ecosystem, of which there were about five um, six ARM partners and two software partners that were that were also ARM um, partners as well. So it's really quite quite exciting for us to see um, that that you know a company like HP is validating what we've said all along in terms of disruption and the benefits uh, that the that the, the scale of the tablet and um, and smartphone markets can bring. So this is a kind of a block diagram of uh, the Applied Micro X gene. I think a lot of you have probably heard or seen uh, about this device. And so it's really exciting for us because they're talking about getting to a super high uh, performance target um, at around, I think they've talked about initially having um, 12 cores at around 2.4 gigahertz. And I think there was a lot of press recently about the fact that they've already sample this to OEM and OS partners. Um, and uh, they're expecting to actually next year come out with a 28 nanometer device that will support 32 cores running up to 3 gigahertz. So again, it's opened up the, not, the kinds of applications and workloads that the ARM architecture um, can run. So Calzada is a partner that um, we've actually uh, had a long relationship with as well. Um, since the inception of the company, and they looked at it in terms of how do you go off and do a design um, if you didn't have legacy constraints and um, you, know, you, were, you were going to do a clean slate design. And so what they did was they looked at, um, you know, of course they have the high performance processor complex, but they integrated the fabric, they integrated the I.O. controllers, um, and they did some advanced energy um, management stuff. Um, and so they're saying the total power is between 5 and 8.5 watts. And later on, I have some data that was actually done in a recent benchmarking um, activity that, that also proves interesting. So again, this is their energy server. It's a quad node um, server design. So basically, you're getting four servers at about 20 watts. And since these slides are online and I have little time, I'll let you read them at your leisure. Um, and this is a box that was actually productized by Boston Limited, which is the Supermicro subsidiary in the UK. Uh, and they basically, you can see they've got 48 quad-core SOCs in a 2U um, kind of a chassis. And actually, that device has uh, been nominated for some green IT awards um, in, in Europe. So Anantech did a benchmarking activity um, where they compared two, uh, they can, Compared a Supermicron um, Micro Xeon E5 server, where basically they had an ES2660, which is their high performance server at 2.2 gigahertz, and it's a 16 core device with 32 threads. Um, and they also had another flavor, which was the low power flavor, which is the um, 2650L. Sorry, I'm, these, these part numbers don't roll off the tongue that well. Anyway, so that was a 1.8 um, gigahertz device. And they had the Boston device was a um, Cortex-A9 1.4 gigahertz. Uh, it was a 24 times 4 core uh, configuration. And the, the Xeon devices had VMware's uh, hypervisor running on it. And I think on the Cortex-A9, it was just basically an example of running the workloads directly on the server nodes. 
So as expected, as you would expect, and you can, you can go off and just put in CalZeta and UnTech and you can come up with the entire report and take a look at it. As expected, for compute intensive workloads, of course the Xeon did better. I mean, no surprise there. Um, and it was ex entirely what we expected. Um, so I think they had some applications where they did um, compression and they did uh, the GCC compile and things like that. And in that case, you know, the Cortex A9 was very competitive with the Atom class of devices, but really we were trying to compare against the Xeon uh, classes of devices, and of course the Xeon did better. But there were workloads where ARM did do well, and, and CalZeta's device did do well. So they basically um, did a web hosting uh, application where they were simulating uh, uh, different numbers. So concurrency here means the number of users, and they scaled the number of users, and they averaged it over 24 web servers. And they, they have a, a test bench that basically simulates these users pinging these websites and kind of going through my, um, navigating the websites and, and completing transactions, etc. Um, and so here you can see that ARM actually did really well. So this is the actual data um, from from the Anantech benchmark. And so another way to look at it is, how does this scale as you increase the number of users? So this orange line here is the um, Boston Virtus, which is the ARM uh, Cortex-A9 from CalZeta-based server. And then the red line is the high-performance Xeon 2660. And the gray line is the 2650L. So the tipping point in terms of ARM, the ARM-based server doing better was actually 15 users um, to where actually you started to perform better than the low power device. And then when you got to 35 users, you started to do better than the high, the high performance device. And, uh, and basically over the, the low power device, we had a 33% better throughput. I can send you that information later. We can, we can, we can talk about it later. But it was, I think it was basically 24 cards, as far as I know. Four cards versus no. And then um, the other part was response time. So obviously lower is better. Uh, and again, as you scaled out over users, you can see the orange line here. Again, we did better. The tipping point was 15, 15 users versus the low power device and then it was versus um, 35 users is where you, you kind of uh, scaled out better. So again, on response time, we did 44% better than uh, the 2650L. So from a power perspective, um, it was really interesting to see the results. So there was some optimization work done on the Boston server and you can see that we were 58% lower power than the 2660 and 23% lower than the 2550L. So when you, when you think about it, for 16% more performance, you had 44% lower power consumption. And the thing was that, it's not me saying it, Anentech said, you know, CalZeta really did it. To the wall, they were about 8.3 watts, which is what they had been claiming all along. So that was actually... Uh, from my perspective, exactly what we expected and a great validation of where we think ARM servers can make a big play. But the real metric isn't, isn't that. It's really performance per watt. So if you, if you average the, the number of uh, responses over the average power, and actually I think we're being conservative because um, there's been a lot of improvements in terms of the power supply that was used on the Boston server since this was done, um, and, and better power optimizations. But essentially, we're about 1.7x um, in terms of responses per watt. And so if you think about how some of these data center operators are um, choosing their metrics for these kinds of applications, it's not on traditional you know, power performances, everything. It's really on performance per watt per dollar. And so this kind of demonstrated uh, exactly what we were expecting. So. Why ARM servers and why now? Again, we're seeing this trend where people are going towards um, highly optimized solutions and one, one 
uh, size does not fit all. And it's really not just about the low power core, it's what you integrate around it to deliver the best uh, system solution. And again, we have partners who are experts in storage, experts in networking, who can actually leverage their expertise uh, to, to bring that to bear in these applications. And so I see three major disruptive elements. Again, adoption of open source, emergence of new ecosystem platforms, and then again, I think change brings opportunity, and I think the fact that we now have um, a number of different, it's not just ARM, it's ARM and our 1,000 connected community partners, or in the case of servers, ARM and at least five to 10 partners that are trying to, to go after this market that can make a difference. So that's my presentation. And we have five minutes left, is that right? We have, we have more than five minutes. We have about 15 minutes total. Thanks for so, staying awake. <laughs> well, thank you very much. But let's first do this part here. And then we take the Q&A. Uh, for the Q&A, there will be a microphone going on. Actually, Anna will be going on with a microphone. Oh, thank after you. After we do the official part. Thank, thank you, you very much. This I'm... is a little thing you can hang in your cubicle and proudly announce that uh, you were here. And of course, oh, you can wear the hat. Thank you. You know, the last time I got something from my triplet.